I'm also very happy to uh, present you. And about presenting, I read an interview with you, and the interviewer started the interview by presenting you in this way. Oh, God. <laughs> Eileen Miles is not a woman poet. She is not a rock star. She is not a badass. She's not a Catholic. She's not a politician. Eileen Me Miles is not a New Yorker. She's not a nature poet. She's not cool. She's not a novelist, a Buddhist, a punk. It's very <laughs> zen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like that introduction, especially with you, because with your, all your writing, it seems to me that you are fighting against categorization, against sort of being boxed in, mm -hmm. whether it's genre, gender, uh, anything, you know. So you say what you are, and then at the same time you say, well, I'm not that. Right. And that's a little bit what your writing is about. Do you, or am I wrong? I, th I think so. I mean, I think, it, you know, as, as a... As a female, as a, as a queer, as a, as a, all these things that I am, I mean, I think we're all I, I'm particularly aware of being seen and responded to according to what a person thinks you are. You know, you're always having to like shed this conversation about what you think you're seeing or what you think you're experiencing, you know? And so I think, you know, writing is an opportunity to be many things. And, and to, to, be, to be always shedding, which we are. I mean, we're always shedding a self in every moment. We're always getting reinvented. If, if, if not, we're, we're dying to some extent. And we're always dying a little bit, too. You know? And so what's, I think it's always kind of like, oh, you just called me a badass again. It was just like, not even a word I like. And I was like, how did I get flattened? I mean, it, it is exactly that. I think you're being very writerly in your response to that. Because I, I think what's, what's sad is to, to be so wiggly and then to be so kind of like, wah, wah. Oh. <laughs> what do you mean, wah, wah? When, whenever you're talked about, then you, you do it, and then you get talked about, and when you get talked about, you got, get flattened. Exactly. And, and I think, how did, the, how did that get to be rebuttoned? Right. I feel the same way. Yeah, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I feel your feelings. <laughs> no. Um, let's go back a little bit because um, this is your first time being published in Denmark, so I want to talk to you both about your life as a poet and a prose writer and an art writer and all the kinds of writing that you do, but also your life and your life and your writing is very intertwined. And uh, you were raised in Boston or outside of Boston, in Arlington. Yeah. Um, you have a very particular Boston accent, I do. which is probably hard to translate into Danish. And your wonderful translator, Mette Musrup, uh, who has translated Ikke Mai to Dansk, um, talked about that yesterday in your event, that you know, the Boston accent was hard to translate. Um, you were raised in a working class family. Mm -hmm. You went to Catholic school. Catholic schools, yes. How has that influenced you? You know, the, both the... You, you do talk a lot about class and money in, or write about that in, 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 your, in your texts. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering how, how did your childhood, your working class background and your, the being raised in a Catholic school influence your writing? Um, a lot. I think, um, I mean, I think uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a sneak. I think Catholic schools make you be a sneak. A sneak? Yeah, yeah, because you're, all, you're really not allowed to present. You're always, you're taught in a rote learning way and you're always, and you're in uniforms and so you're always reminded that you're representing the uniform, you know, so they just, you're endlessly stripped of a self and there's all this teeming that's going on inside of you when you're a kid, you know, and, and so I think, um, I think my, my writing winds up just being something that like I'll, I'll, accept the flatness of it and then I and then I you know like I kind of I keep contradicting myself in my work because it's sort of you do take that message you get you do take it straight on and you do obey to some extent or I, I mean you I am somewhat obedient not entirely rebellious and then it was like oh wait a second I forgot to rebel and then I go do it you know and so I think there's this kind of shuttling um, behavior in the writing all the time. Is shuttling behavior the same as being sneaky? Or what's well, I, yes. Well, sneaky is it's a, you, you sort of like you you are, you're like willing to say yes, and then you go do what you want, 
you know, so you do one and like we all went to, we all had to go to mass as Catholic kids and, and my family and there were three of us and my brother was the oldest so he had the debate head on with my mother. He rebelled, he refused to go to mass. My sister was the youngest so she was like the baby and my mom's companion so she would just like wake, you know, like the, uh, my brother and I were already gone and my sister would just be like there reading the paper with my mother and my mother would say, aren't you going to, the, going to mass? My sister would lower the paper and go, oh Jen. Just raise the paper, you know? Whereas I would be the good one who would go to Mass, meet my friends, and not go to Mass. So I just performed that I was going to Mass all the time, you know, and then do what I wanted. And so part of me winds up in love with that performance of looking like I'm being good and then not being good and, and find that exciting, even in others too. It's sort of like, what's more exciting than, you know, somebody that you know in a certain way and then you go and have sex with them and you see them turn into somebody else. You were like, whoa, it's a unicorn, you know? <laughs> Can it be opposite too, that, that you're bad, but then you actually go to mass, if you see what I'm saying? That you're, you're acting bad, but then you're sort of doing something virtuous or? Yeah, yeah. I think my real life in some ways is like that. I think I'm like Your a real dis- life. Yeah. There's, I mean. What, is a real, what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, when you're like, you know, just having a, a date or hanging out with somebody or having a cup of coffee or somebody's getting to know you and then they, they, you're not a badass. You're just kind of like, you know. <laughs> So I'm not, I mean, I'm not so, that's why the bad I was like, God, what a ridiculous thing to have to be performing, you know, when I'm just another kind of medium person. Well, I find a lot of melancholy actually in your text or in your, both in your prose and your poetry. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree? I would agree, yes. I think, I mean, I think melancholy is like this residue from, in some ways, undigested sadness too. You know, it's like things are so overwhelming that you don't know what to do with them or where to put them. And so it just kind of, the melancholy just kind of streams on a little bit. Sadness from, from your childhood, from just from the beginning or just built up or? Well, I always make a great deal of my father's death, but it was a big deal. My dad died when I was 11 and I was there in the room when it happened and he was great and he was a very terrible alcoholic and I love my father. I mean, I don't, it's so weird when, when of course I'm 67 years old. When my dad died, I was 11 and so, I, ha I have a biography of this man that is totally, probably untrue. You know what I mean? Like, I've just made up who this character was. I know very little about who this person was, you know, but I've been mourning that person, all the versions of them, all my life. And so, and, and didn't know how to mourn when I was a kid. And so it, it, I think that I did all the things that such people do, you know, like in terms of drugs and alcohol, and just sort of acting out, and, you know, and then having to tell people drunkenly the story of her father's death, you know, repeatedly. I was like, oh, here she goes, you know. And so I think this part's like, you know, I, I, my next book is, is about a dog um, that I had, uh, it's called Afterglow, and I had a dog, a pit bull named Rosie from 1990 to 2006. And the thing that was incredible about having a dog, or one of the things that was incredible was that when the dog died, I was there, and I was there through her dying. And I was an adult, and I could articulate it, and I could witness it, and I could, you know, and I felt like, to such an extent, I felt like I was finally mourning my dad through my dog, you know. Is a lot of your writing, I mean, you said you didn't know how to mourn as a kid. Is writing or writing poetry, is that a form of mourning? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I was bobbing before you even finished the, the, the question. Yeah, yeah, I think mon writing is, is massive mourning, you know? And mourning for five minutes ago, like I'm sad about that, you know? It's just, it, it's, it's sort of a continuous process. And then, and then celebration, of course and excitement and joy, you know, but lots of mourning, yeah. But uh, is that sort of, uh, is that a little bit of the, the nature of poetry? Because, I mean, you're very inspired or, or influenced by many poets that mm -hmm. you talk about and that you write, I mean, Frank O'Hara uh, among them, um, uh, Schuller. Uh, is, is mourning a side of poetry? Is that what, what brought you to poetry? Maybe, I mean, I think, I, you know, I just, 
In high school, I liked sort of nature poetry and sort of emotional, I mean, like Dylan Thomas and Wordsworth and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And part of it was just like, there was just this, they were like cartoons of sadness. They were like these outside moments and they were these sort of, it was just, it was kind of interesting that there were these people. Who are these people, these poets? These kind of like, what well, were they just kind of walking along and suddenly, you know, when they turn, you know, and write this, which is actually true, you know, but I think, who, you know, like there was nothing like that, you know, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, except in these books in school. And so I think when I started to feel, you know, stricken with melancholy in high school, um, I, I, I just remember going down to the pond and lying there and looking at the trees and then trying to write some Dylan Thomas-like poem, you know? Um, so it just seemed like there was, this, there was this place that you could go with poetry, always. Do you want to read for us? Sure. Read something. Actually, I wanted, um, we talked a little bit before we came here, and I wanted to read from Chelsea Girls, which is a novel, um, and you said you would do that. So we... It's still true. It's still true, you can still... <laughs> so, you read a little, and then you jump a little here, and then you read to there. Okay. Right? So... Do they know where they are? See, I mean, I think. Do they know where you're reading? No. Well, no, no. I mean, like, just in the world. Something? In no, the world can. of the book, I think that that the I, the Eileen character has gone to Maine to visit an ex, and they all drink a lot, and then the ex has a new girlfriend, and the ex and the new girlfriend are fighting in a car, and and a cop comes along, and then the rest happens. And it's interesting that you say the Eileen character because, uh, and we're going to talk about that later, but. Because Eileen yeah. is a character, Absolutely. and Eileen Miles is a character in a lot of your books. Yeah, but it is yeah. a novel, yes, and she's yes. a character. So yeah. let's just get that straight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> See, I come from an alcoholic household, and resultingly kind of don't react to violence. I think it terrifies me, but I'm so drawn to it. I never hit anyone, but I would love to kill a lot of people. There was a fat woman god I really had it in for. You are a traitor to women. You're a dyke. Hey, you big bull dyke. Look at you, you bitch, you traitor. You like to suck cunt, don't you? We leap forward. Now we're in the police station. I'm a poet. She's getting arrested. I'm a poet, you fools, you asshole cops. Poet has always meant to me saint or hero, the dancing character on the stained glass window of my soul, the hand lift, lifting slowly through time, the whir that records my material against strong light. Gosh, why I live. It's the channel this ex-Catholic took when getting down on her knees didn't keep anyone alive or help the dead stay dead. I was a devout child, but my, my prayers were ritualistic insur insurance and a real list of dead people. God, take care of grandma, grandpa. It became so long it was unfeasible by about age 11 or 12. So I began to keep a diary and sat under the light of the hall stairs and recorded what I ate that day and who I thought hated me and who I loved and how I won. The poem got born in jobs when I realized I wouldn't win, wasn't in fact even present. So I began, to take, I began to take up residence in my poems, saw my life as a loser's, hence poetic. And then we jumped here, right? No, just you can Oh, we, I keep going. Yeah, you can. Okay, okay, so you're a poet. Let's hear a poem. I don't know my poems. <laughs> I preferred, snobbishly, being baldly attached to the page. I hold the poem, the sacred document. Oh, all right, this is like martyrdom, baptism by fire, by blood. It's called roast chicken. <laughs> I hesitated, stumbled, and forgot a lot, and they mocked me, but I got it out, nothing happened. Sometimes, roast chicken. Okay, okay, roast chicken. Sometimes, some poet, she doesn't even know her poem. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I think about holding you. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful to see you read and hear you read because it is a performance. I mean, you are, are uh, your, your poems are very, I mean, you're very present when you read. Mm -hmm. it, your whole body, it's like you're a musician. It's yeah. your whole body moves with, with the poem or yeah. with, the, with the, the, the language. Yeah. Uh, 
is performance a big part of the writing or of the of of, of your work as a poet and a writer? Right. Is um, it? Well, I when I first came to New York to be a poet in my twenties. I wanted to be published, and I would, and, and there were like certain poetry magazines you would see in the racks all the time. They were like bigger ones, you know, in bookstores. And so I would mail my poems to them, and they would mail me back rejection slips, you know. And I was like, ah, you know. And I didn't understand how one got published. So, but what there was then, and there still is, there was such a piece of the poetry world is the open mic. Right, and, and some bar or some poetry space or some art gallery on one Monday a month has an open mic. And then all the, all the young kids and the losers and the old people and everybody who hasn't figured out where they fit in the poetry world yet signs up, you know? And you get up and nobody's listening to anybody else to some extent. You're like, whoo, you know? <laughs> And, and, and so, I, I, so much of my training as a poet was, was doing the open mics. And then of course, if you're any good, they would like, we're gonna give you a feature. And I was like, whoa. You know, and I did my first feature at CBGB's, which was very cool. Um, and then it just became, and so, and then uh, within a year or two, I figured out that poetry magazines, which are often little, like I was in a workshop, and the guy next to me in the workshop, Mike, had a poetry magazine called Personal Injury. And he just said, can I have that poem for my, you know, and I, oh, that's how it happens. Like, it's not out there, it's, yeah. it's pretty close. And that's how the poetry world starts. It's an intimate machine. So, but, but I definitely was introduced to, to my poems being outside of me by, by the act of reading them. And I, and I loved, you know, and I think too, I never played a musical instrument, but I always wanted to. I always wanted to be in a band. Um, so that it, it felt did. like when I, yeah. I went, Why so weren't I, you in a band? I mean, are you... Well, if you wanted to be, I mean, I mean, obviously, just I wasn't um, intense enough about that. I, I didn't know how to make the things I wanted happen happen. I, don't, I mean, I just kind of, I didn't take musical instrument. I mean, I for some reason, my family, which was not that poor, wouldn't let me take music lessons. Let me reframe the question. In what way has because, like I said, or we talked about, sound is so important mm -hmm. in your work. I mean. You write about sound and, and just the sound of the words and the, the sound of the, the poems and the sound of voice. Voice is, is just everything yeah. in reading you. Um, in what way has music um, influenced or informed your writing? Huge, huge. I mean, I was just like, well, again, what? when I was in my 20s, it was that moment of the singer-songwriter, you know, and Joni Mitchell, you know, and it was just like they were doing, I mean, they were writing such great, she was writing such great feminist crazy songs, you know, and, and it was just like, you know, of course, Patti Smith, you know, who was like really happening when I first came to New York, and so it was just like this crossover from poetry to rock and roll seemed immediate, though you didn't need to cross over, it was just that's what she had done, but there were just literally lines, like there was a jo Joni Mitchell um, line that was, she tapes her regrets to the microphone stand, and I was like, yes, and I remember doing my first reading, and I felt like right away, I was so, I just, I'm, I'm in that lineage, I'm, these are my regrets, you're my regrets, you know? And, and so it just, it is, I mean, like this following, I mean, it just, it seemed to be a way to be winning in melancholy at once, once which is what song writing. I mean, I love song, and poems are songs. I mean, it really is a similar, a similar art in a certain way. And, 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 and two, it's just like, I think it's taken me years to let the work sound like the way it hears, it, it sounds in my head, because I think so much poetry and, and writing even is an act of listening. You know, there's a bit of a, a bit when of crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. Active listening. Yeah, there's Writing. a bit of craziness going on. You're kind of like you're kind of like somebody's secretary, you know. But it's it's me, you know. Can you say more about that? The listening when you're writing and the what? I mean, I think that just is the sensation. I think when I first started to write, I didn't know where it was coming from. You know, I mean, it was kind of, I mean, I began, like when I was growing up, I was always drawing, you know, like lots of people were, but I was, I was good at it. So I thought, oh, I'm an artist, you know, and stuff. And there was an act of rebellion that meant I didn't go to art school, I went to college. But college became the place where instead of sitting there drawing everybody around me, I started writing poems in my notebook, you know, so they just started to, and I didn't, I mean, but, but when I continued it, I just felt a little bit like I didn't quite know who was speaking, you know, it felt like it started to feel like, I had a mentally ill grandmother who was, she was an Irish immigrant and she was in, 
when I was four, five, and six, we would go visit on Sundays. We would go to the mental hospital and visit my grandmother. I thought that was normal, you know? And, and she was Irish and she spoke in a very intense accent. She sort of mumbled. And, and I remember, I think when I was starting to take poetry seriously, but before I encountered the poetry world, I was sort of a, I was a little depressed. I was a little alcoholic. I was a little bit, you know, in the bathroom looking at myself in the mirror and, and stuff. And, and it seemed like that voice, that person, that mumbling person was something like me and something like my grandmother. I just didn't know who the hell was talking, really, you know? And I was a little afraid that this poetry thing was part of my going crazy. And I was very afraid of going crazy and yet really intrigued by mental illness. And it's, it's part in my family and in my, in my life, you know? There were people who went someplace, you know, and who were they, and was I one of them, and what could happen? I mean, and you know, I, I think the 20s is a, is a decade of endangerment, you know, it's especially for females. You just don't know what's going to happen to you and where you're going to go, and there isn't much reinforcement in the culture to tell you that it's going to be okay, and we're with you. You know, you're usually taught that if anything nice happens to a girl, she got it, you didn't, you know, yes. or at least in, in when I was growing up. I think it's still like that? To some, ex to some extent, to some extent, I think, mm -hmm. the way women get celebrated, they get so somehow, sometimes celebrated at each other, rather yeah. than, like, this is a great, like, I think when a great thing happens for a guy, I think is a bit of a, like, this happened for all of us, you know, and I think it's, it's harder for women to have that, to have, find that kind of celebration with each other, you know, and I, I, one of the nice things, I've gotten attention for the past few years, and I think I just was part of the, you know, the gang of jerks and creeps and us for so long that when I got some attention, at least to hear, everybody has acted like it was one for the team, which was really sweet. You know, people didn't act like, like, oh, here's Eileen Miles getting more things, you know? It's been nice, you know? And, um, but um, maybe there aren't, there isn't such a sense, I mean, I think we've got to build it, like a feeling of being in the trenches with each other, women. You know, that, that, this, that we're all part of this kind of victory and conquest and, and, and struggle, you know? You write a lot about this in, in many places. You, you've said something that I wrote down about the artist Nicole Eisenman, who yeah. you've written about and who's painted you as a man. Sort of, uh, sort, sort of, of. Eileenish man. Yes, an oh. Eileenish man. But you say about her, this artist, was born in 1965, I think, you say, she's the unusual female who isn't all broken, but who loves brokenness. Huh. So what is, why is it unusual that she's a female and not broken? Um, I mean, one of the cool, I mean, her, If you don't know her work, Nicole Eisenman is just, is just great and wonderful and funny and funky. And I mean, sometimes you see somebody's art and you think, if I made art, that would be the art that I would make. Or that you love the art because it brings the thing out. But I think when I, one of her first shows, it was like she was a muralist, among other things. She was, so she was really into big, which was so great. And then it was like in the 90s, and it was a moment where there was like the funky wall. Like it was like, There was, it was like her show was like the big mural and then a wall of stuff. And it was like little drawings and penned up things and, and you know, like language. And, 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 and one of the things on the wall which made me so happy was a, a cutout from an art book. And it was Pablo Picasso, age eight. And it was like one of his drawings as, that he did as a child. And then it was like, below it was like Nicole Eisenman, age nine. And it was one of her works. And I just, it was such a, a, it was such a, you know, like a beautiful, strong, bragging gesture to say, I, I was a child artist, I have a history, I'm a great artist today, I'm like Pablo Picasso, you know, or he's like me, you know? And, and you know, I, think, I just think it just, it is reason to cheer when a, when a female artist kind of takes that kind of punk tack. But, uh, Then uh, back to my question, because there, there, I think in, in, now I'm not sure in what poem or book you wrote it, but it, it, you say something like, she made me all womany, or, or, or I, I felt womany, womany. Yeah. she womaned me, she womaned me. Right, right. Because she, she 
it's, it's a girlfriend you have who's acting like sort of a married man and she womaned me. Oh, right, right, and, right. And I was thinking about that quote and also the sort of the broken female or, you know, or the... Oh, 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 go and back. I, I want to, can I go back and answer yeah, your question? Because the, the thing about Nicole Eisenman is that she came from a family that celebrated her as a young artist. You know, like her mother was a shrink. You know, it was just like when she was reviewed in the New York Times, they quoted her mother saying, we always knew she was great. I was like, oh my God. And so I just thought she was so not broken. You know, it's just like where I was just like, Ugh. Did, did your parents ever say to you that you were great? My father thought I was amazing. And I think my mother perhaps felt great things about me, but she was the type, she was a big triangulator. So she'd, you'd leave the room and she'd say, Eileen's great to my brother or sister. So then they would hate my ass. You know, we were just like, she was like that. She was, you know, she was just this great, this woman who didn't go to college and didn't go to Europe ever. You know, she just, so she loved me and she hated me, which I think is a lot of mother-daughter relations. Um, so where yeah. were we? We were going forward. Yeah, yeah we were going forward. Yeah. I wanted you to read some more. Okay. Uh, actually, I want you to read from Chelsea Girls one more time. Um, I don't even think I mentioned that I wanted you to read this part, but maybe you'll do it anyway. But you can be broken and put yourself back together. I think that's what making art is, too. You know, you're making yeah. this kind of collage of beauty or success or making failure beautiful. I mean, I think as you kind of, you reconstruct your, your wholeness, you know? And then the cracks mean it's real, I think. Is that, but is that brokenness having to do with being a woman? Pro I mean, I, I would say because I am, I would say it does, yeah. I don't know it any other way. Uh, can you read? This is from a piece called My Father's Alcoholism, or a chapter mm -hmm. called My Father's Alcoholism. So if you read from there, and you see, to that, there. To there, that's quite a read, yeah. okay. Sure. Yeah, a I little can, piece. I could do it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Hey. My father insisted from the get-go that he was in the same frame as me. He elbowed his way into my consciousness. That's Eileen, that's Eileen. As if the world were a school about me. Relatives participated in the plot. One of them, my father's white-haired brother, Ed, gave us a storybook about a little girl with braids who loved to play with kittens. And as if I were an idiot, my father showed the book to me and said, that's Eileen. I mean, yeah, I had braids and a cap, but was I cute as a picture in a book? Childhood is wide and impersonal. Something that was not me, but showed me the world on its way, is gazing down at a bowl of milk with Rice Krispies glistening in the morning sun. Breakfast, so beautiful, I didn't even want to eat it. The darkest part of my house was the stairs. You had to come down so the day could begin. My father went to work very early. He was, he was a mailman. Weekends, however, he would hold court in the parlor. Atmosphere would be pumped out on 78s all day. Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald, Bing. Danny Kay singing those boisterous, er, eerie tunes. Oh, Thumbelina, don't be dumb, tum, tum, tum. My mother's participation in the weekend music festival was evidence that they loved each other. The occasional dance through the house, my mother's sighs at the appropriate song as she worked. This was, that this was going on all the time was a fact of life in the weekend, like my dad. One morning, moving down through the darkness from the kids' world, a song came on downstairs, and with its opening bars, my father yelled out, this is Eileen's song. Gordon McRae was belting out, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day, I've got a wonderful feeling, everything's going my way. The singer went on to describe how the cows were doing and the beauty of the fields. He was this big, happy farmer. I must have expressed appreciation of the tune at some point, that had to be it, but I never wanted to hear it every weekend when I came down the stairs. <laughs> Even today, it's accompanied by reluctant floods of light. You didn't want to be thought about that much before you even knew you were there. I can remember a time when my name was for other people before I even knew it was mine. The anonymous quality of its vowels, I, being a word you heard a lot. Later, I would know it was a pronoun, but before I could write, before anything had established that different contexts for sounds, words, meant different things, the I, I heard a lot when people spoke, seemed to mean you. Sometimes they talked about themselves and said I, but if they looked at me or said it loudly and it meant you, then lean that part. <laughs> you know. Thank you. So I'm 
There's the whole issue of pro pronouns, personal pronouns uh -huh. in your writing. I mean, first of all, you, you use your name, uh, as we talked about a little bit. I mean, you use your name, right. but Eileen Miles, or Eileen, yes. is a character. Yeah. It's not you. Um, you have your, your uh, poetry um, book called Not Me. Uh -huh. I mean, it is very personal. I mean, one could say it's, uh, it is you, but then it says Not Me, eller Ikke Mai. Um, another book, which is uh, a collection of your poetry from your whole life, says I must be living twice. So it's, it's you and maybe somebody else who's mm -hmm. living parallel with you. I mean, so there's all this, you know, floating um, of who is the I, and mm -hmm. even in your name is, you know, there's an I, mm -hmm. Eileen. And then I read an interview with you, or heard an interview with you, where you said, oh, I don't want to be a her or a him, I'd rather be a they, they. Right, right. so that when we talk about you, I should talk about they. So they published this book sure. and this book, yeah. and they were raised. So, so what's your deal with, with this, huh. <laughs> with the whole with uh, pronouns. pronouns and you and Well, you've asked so they. many different questions in one go. I know, that, that was, was amazing. a long question, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I've been reading so, you all summer, so yeah. it's popping. Well, I think part of it, part of it with the, the I must be living twice is this feeling that, I mean, I think we've all lived in the era since, since the 20th century of with, with the Walter Benjamin thing of the, the age of mechanical reproduction. There's a copy of everything, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like there's essentially a copy of the 20th century, right? It's the, it's the what, first... What is the copy of the 20th there century? There is a copy, you there know what I mean? Is like a copy. Somewhere or collectively the whole cent century was copied. Basically, if you weren't there, you could go there to some extent. I mean, there are people oh, who know okay. the 70s better than me who are like in their 20s now because it's a copy of the 70s. <laughs> so why would you believe me when you've read the copy, you know? <laughs> so I think there's a, so that I is, is part of that too. It's sort of like when I copy myself, it's, it's, it's both a documentary gesture and then a personal gesture depending on which way I want to play it, you know? Mm. I think that like artists like Andy Warhol changed everything mm. by, you know, the guy that went to the party and had a tape recorder and was just like recording everybody. I mean, I tried that when I lived in Boston and it just was abysmal. But, <laughs> but you know, I also saw and I, and I grew up in the era in New York when Allen Ginsberg and Andy Warhol, who were the two most famous people in the neighborhood, always went to the party with a camera. And part of it was the fact that they were always being recorded and always being copied, and the only way they could deal with it was to take a picture of you, you know? And now I think we have this funny moment, we're all taking pictures of each other constantly, you know? So I think we all have so many multiples and so many copies and so many, you know? And the, certainly the gender thing though, I think it always, I mean, I did grow up feeling like I was a boy, praying to be a boy, going before I went to bed at night, I think, oh, please, God, let me wake up being a boy, you know? And, and, and then I wake up and be like, Eileen. And it, part of it, I'm sure, was that I just boys got what I wanted. Why couldn't I have what he had? Why couldn't I go where he went? Why couldn't I what look like... What is it that they had that you wanted? Um, just freedom, space, primacy. I mean, it just boy, my brother could have more than I could because he was the boy. You know, he didn't have to wash dishes because he was the boy. You know, it just seemed like a much, if I'll, ta I'll take what he got, you know? If, they, if it was a restaurant, I would, that's how I would order. I'll have what he's having, you know? And so I, I definitely came, and then I, you know, like acculturated through puberty and junior high, and I was like, I wound up being okay at being a girl. I was good looking enough. I convinced everybody I was female. But I always had this feeling like when I approached having relationships with boys that they would find out that I wasn't really a girl that I was a boy. I didn't even know what that meant. It was just a feeling of fraudery, you know, that I think, to feel like a fraud is, I think, probably a very common feeling. But, but I definitely felt what it. What is that feeling? Feeling of fraud? How well, does that, that feel? That, and that, how does it manifest that you're, itself? You're aware of performing, that you're aware of performing, and this is supposed to be an intimate space. You know, isn't there a place when you stop performing and stop watching yourself and start being, you know? Is so, there? Is there? Yes, but it comes and goes, right? I mean, I feel like as a feeling where you're kind of like, oh my God, it's sublimity, or just, or just love or something where you just feel lucky and you know you're present and you're, collect and you're connected and you don't stand outside watching yourself thinking, is she getting away with it? Is she getting away with it? Um, 
And so, so I think when, when, when there became this discourse which came out of um, trans issues, that, that, that this was this pronoun they, in fact, I had this experience because I was dating, I was dating Jill Soloway, who um, did Transparent. Transparent, and, the television series on HBO? Uh, yeah. About Transparent, and the dad. And I love Dick is what she's done now, the TV series, I love Dick. Right. And you were dating. And Jill so Soloway. I'm dating Jill, which meant that when she was being profiled for the New Yorker, they interviewed me, you know? And so then they were like, well, how do you feel about they? And I was like, you know, it's not very intuitive. I don't know, it doesn't really sound, you know, blah, blah, blah. But weirdly, at that same time, like right in that same time, I was, I was, I think I was thinking, I don't know why I was thinking about that Bible quotation, like where, like, Christ is talk is being asked to exercise a demon out of somebody, you know? And he was like, okay, I mean, like, I guess that's what he got to do. So he goes to the demon and says, what is your name? And the demon goes, my name is Legion. And I just always thought that was so haunting and I never knew what it meant because legion I associate with the army or Romans. I went to Catholic schools, it was, you know. But suddenly I thought, oh, it means many. My name is legion, you know. I, and I just suddenly thought, they is legion, you know. And I do feel like sometimes I feel female, sometimes I feel male, sometimes I feel androgynous, sometimes I feel absent. And I thought, they is the pronoun of that feeling. It, it, it's a performative pronoun. And I thought, that's mine, I'll take that, you know? And it's been interesting, you know, like it's sort of like who, I had to really fight um, Harper Collins to get, they, they were like, it's not really conventional. I was like, you know, <laughs> sent them Atlantic, you know, it's just like as, as somebody big enough says, no, we see, you know, then they start to convince other tall people that this is true, but. Uh. You had, I mean, you were for a very long time, you were a poet, an underground poet, or uh, I don't like these labels. And then all these things started happening. Everyone w w started reading you, and your books were republished and uh, reissued, and big publishing houses, and interviewed by mm -hmm. Paris Review and The New Yorker, and you got a poem in The New Yorker. And I mean, it's just, you know, you're huge, you're mm -hmm. being translated. Um, and uh, Jill Soloway based a character on you in Transparent. I don't know who has seen Transparent here. Okay, some. So there's a poet in the television series Transparent that is based on you and she reads a poem uh, written by you. How was it seeing yourself? Oh, I don't remember the name of the actress, but it was an actress who portrayed you. How? how? Cherry Jones. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. How was? How did that, when we're I, talking about I mean, multiples? Funny, funny. I mean, the funniest moment, I think, was maybe because they were... Funny were, as in ha-ha or funny as in weird? Both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I went to a dinner party in Los Angeles at Jill's, and I hadn't met Cherry before, but she was being having her hair cut like mine and, and, and studying me in videos and stuff, and it was so funny. It was just like... And she sort of walked into the door of the apartment, and we looked at each other, and it was like... I don't know if it's like Prince and the Popper or is a com, but it was just like that kind of moment. And I think it was just like, because we were both very receptive to the joke of it. And it was just so funny to look at each other and it was like act, actor and original as if I'm an original and, and, and to be, you know, so there the was just like a very, and then all these things that we were talking about are, are copies and stuff. So then I was thinking, of course I would get copied, you know, and stuff. And, and, and again, you know, like around issues like gender, I think, Growing up, like in grade school, I mean, grade school is just like the epitome of, of hours and hours of studying other people. You know, you just sit there and they get, somebody gets called and they walk, they stand up and walk to the front of the class and you, you walk how they walk. You walk, you watch how they walk, you know? And I was like, I like how he walks, you know? And then I start walking like, you know? <laughs> Or it's just like, I remember like thinking about, you know, like I would have crushes on boys and I just, there's that whole class of people where you're like, am I having a crush on you because I want you or I want to be you, you know? So it was just like, and I would just notice when the, I mean like Catholic schools were brutal, that when the nun would hit this boy, you know, his hair would do something cool. And I was like, <laughs> I'd like my hair to do that, you know? So it's just like, I'm a copy, we've just been doing, you know, so it's just like there was a way, also just like a, a, who's, 
you know, how big is your fantasy life? Because it's a, like this whole thing about obscure poet. I mean, again, you could be famous in the little room in which you're in. It's like 25 people in this room, and all 25 people know your work and love it. So you're like, oh, here I am. You know, I'm like, <laughs> and I've, I've definitely given readings years ago where I would, you know, like some book would come out, and I'd be so excited, and I'd be in a little tiny bookstore, and I would be kneeling, and I would feel like a rock star, and I'd think, there's something a little demented about this. <laughs> like, you think you're in a stadium show. <laughs> So I think that and then when that person, that grandiose person has this moment where suddenly you're getting all this attention, it's just like, yeah. You know, it, it, on some level, it feels right because I've always been as big as I am, but <laughs> I was, you know, it's sort of like full. I was already, the glass was full, you know? So the glass is still full. It's just a different glass, you know? <laughs> And also, I'm just so old. It's just like, if I was really famous in my 20s, what would I have done? Shot a lot of heroin and died, or just done... Yeah, I wanted or, to... I've written so much that what could... I mean, I'm too late, I'm ruined. I mean, I've been saying since my 40s, I'm already ruined, you know? So nothing's going to ruin me. It's not going to change me, you know? I'm just going to write my next book, you know? I want to... Um... Well, two things I wanted to ask for what you were saying, because you said if, if I'd been famous in my 20s, I would have probably... You know, died drunk, or you said something like, I mean, I mean, you, there's a lot of alcohol stop, in your early, yeah. there's a lot of drugs and alcohol in your early writing, yeah. and uh, you have, uh, you know, and there's a kind of dizziness almost to some of the writing, I mean, it's sort of, not that the writing is drunk, but there's a dizziness or a vertigo or a kind of intoxication in the writing, in mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been open about in interviews that you, like your father, you drank too much, you were an alcoholic, mm -hmm. or are an alcoholic, and, but you're not yeah. drinking, and right. you, you became sober. What happened to your writing when you became sober? At first, it was horrible. At first, I just wrote such stupid stuff. I thought, oh no, this is really bad. You know, I just like, because I, I was, you're foggy. If you've been, I mean, it's like, you quit smoking, you quit anything, it's sort of like, or when you're actually using drugs. I remember I, I really loved amphetamines, because I love going fast, and I love never having to sleep, you know, and I felt like a god, you know? And so I'd like, take all the speed for a weekend, and then I think, Monday, I'll stop, and then I'll do this nice thing, and I'll do this nice thing. And Monday would come, and you would just be like, destroyed. You'd just be lying on your bed. And I was always in denial of the fact that there was this after effect. You know, there, everything, it's sort of like there's a balance. You throw a rock into a pond, it makes ripples. And so when you get sober or you quit smoking or something, you're just in this altered, you're in a new altered state. And you have to survive that in some way. And so at first that, that altered state did not know how to write, you know? And then, and I, and I think maybe I, at a certain point I really decided that, but I knew that, I really knew I was gonna die if I kept drinking the way I was drinking, it was bad. And, um, cause I was like a falling down drunk, I was terrible, you know, and, and I love booze. And so I think I just decided that even if I can't be a poet anymore, which was my favorite thing, I'm still gonna keep not drinking. And I think as soon as I made that decision, I could write again, it was the craziest thing. You know, that I think, I think I just needed, uh, I needed uh, a sort of- What was the decision? Hmm? That, you, that you would never drink again? No, 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 I could never you... make that decision. No, what, what decision? I just decided that even if I couldn't be a poet anymore, you would... I would still not drink right. today. And then... And, and so that, that quickened the, the, the process, you know? And then I just started to understand how interesting... I mean, life is so interesting. You know, being clean is a state. You know, and within it, you get depressed and you get moody, you get charged up. You, you know, I started running, I started exercising and realized what a good high it is to, to, you know, run three miles. You know, I was like, whoa, you know, I just like every, it was, so I had better sex after I got sober than I'd ever had when I was drinking because I would just like fall, pass out on people, you know? <laughs> I was like, I love you, you know, I was just always falling on people, you know? <laughs> And it was just like, now I was like, there I was. I was like, really? I didn't know this, this is what happened. So it just, you know, it's, it's just, you know, but it's just, it's just everything, everything is a state, aging. And now aging is the new problem because I realize, oh, I don't have as much energy as even I had when I was 40. And I have to take it into account that I will be tired. If I do this and this and this and this, I will be tired. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. You know, so it's just like everything, life is just one long trick, you know that you have to get accustomed to and, and figure out, because it, it keeps being a new studio to write in. That's the thing that's really great. It's like every new condition is a condition in which you can make art, 
you know, or not make art, or not make a phone call, you know? I wanted to ask you actually to read a poem. All and, right. Um, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, trees, and we talked about that before we, when we talked. There's a lot of trees in all your writing. Uh, and I wanted to, to read a late poem. You've been reading some from your early work, but I wanted to, you to read a late poem, which is about trees. Um, and I have to tell you, there's a poet among the beats. What was his name? There was a poet. I can't even think of his name right now. He was like one of the, the fringe of... of mm. um, Ray Bremser was his name, and so when I, was, when I was in my 20s, like all the old beats, there were famous ones and not so famous ones, and we would go to hear them read. And he came to do a reading at, in New York at St. Mark's Church, and he was so drunk, and he was so fucked up. And he had this famous poem, and it's, one of its refrains was, I am a tree, I am a tree, except that he couldn't even sit on the chair. And <laughs> it was so hard and sad and funny. It was just like everything, and he just was like, like, I am a tree, I am a tree, and it's just so devastating. But, but, I, but I do feel like I am a tree. You, I am, why? I am a tree. You I don't know, tree. I don't know. It's just like, we, do we camp out in certain parts why? of nature, why and you trees? look at a dog, and you think, I'm a dog. You know, like, why, why am I not, I'm an otter. Did you see that movie, Lobster? Yes. What a great movie, right? I know, I think I took bird. I thought bird, I would be a bird. Bird. Yeah, bird, so bird tree. And there's snowflakes now in your poem. Snowflakes, like bird, snowflakes, dogs, very, yeah. trees. I mean, think of you as you know, city poet. It's yeah. Ireland, Boston, and then New York. But, but we I mean, have you're trees really, and, and dogs trees. and snowflakes. Well, yeah, but you're sort of out in <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. But what is, there's that great Frank O'Hara line about if he, he doesn't what, he doesn't feel comfortable seeing a tree unless he knows there's a subway nearby. <laughs> <laughs> Are you like that? Or no, no, no. I love, I love nature. It's, I need both. I feel, you know, I, I live a lot in Texas now, and I, I'm really happy out there in, in the West, in, you know, mountains, West Texas, Marfa, Texas. But, um, but then I realize, I just, and I think I don't even need New York. And then suddenly, you know, I get back to New York, and I was like, oh my God, this is my life. You know, so I really need both a lot. A, a poem. Yeah. What tree am I waiting? Yeah. It's such a beautiful... I wrote this in Belfast. What that's worth. What tree am I waiting? That whole part of the world where I won't go anymore, that whole separation that I won't feel high in this house, in this hemisphere, in this artificial light that is artificial in the earliest morning, dark in pages and pens, in an unfamiliar bed in the foot curl furniture, each rumble when morning comes and it's still morning and it's still night. I married a dead girl. We were born in her bloom. Remember that fat bumblebee landed on a lamp? I opened the doors and I forgot and the house got colder and colder. Where is this house? The seam between boards merely gains my attention. It's dark and thin. I monitor each situation, my bladder growing full. Climb down, climb up. What tree am I waiting my whole life in weather? Waiting for my raft. I'll fly to another island. I'll take a train. Already I know it will hurt. This is the hurt country. I came here to hold the hurt like a bird, like a tree. Traffic has rings. We watch it whirl around, damaging our night. Great continents hold the feelings and the ages. What is mine going blind? Great masses of them not going home. The country drew a line because of memory. One said, I feel my heart race ahead. In eternity, there is this ache. There is this wakefulness. Thank you. We have, we can't end without talking about politics. Okay. Um, because at your reading yesterday, you did read a few new poems about the political situation in, in the U.S. now. But you ran for president. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and... It started in 91. 
Yes, 91 to 92. Yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, it was started as a performance piece, but I mean, you actually did run for president and you've said that you were ready to serve. Exactly. And what were your main issues? Um, well, the main issue was mm -hmm. that the politicians who were running weren't telling you what they were thinking, they weren't writing their own speeches, and they weren't really representing anyone except a very small, you know, the, what we call the 1% now. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed like, um, I mean, I think when I first, you know, the, George Bush made the, made the famous speech in the 90s about, um, about the politically correct, and it was when that term was, more, was moved from the left to the right, you know? And, and, and then he said the real danger to freedom of speech in the 90s was the politically correct, and that, that activists and women and queers and whoever was complaining more than once was, was really a problem to freedom of speech, you know? And, and when I read that, I just thought, oh my God, you know, and, and it just, I, uh, it, and they, they announced that it was the beginning of the campaign trail, that speech, you know, and I just thought, what if I ran for president, you know, and then I could just make speeches and I could, you know, like enter this dialogue and, and represent all these people, artists and women and everybody who wasn't being represented in the campaign that year. Um, so it just, it seemed like an amazing piece of, of language and, and performance and public opportunity and to, and to campaign as a poet. You know, too, and that I would write all my own speeches, and I would tell you what I was thinking, and my my platform. Every, I mean, every piece of it. What was so interesting was that it was like a like poets take workshops, and they're always given these prompts. You know, and they're like, write a poem that's a sonnet, and there's a dog in every line, and there's a yellow <laughs> feeling about the poem. You know, it's just like, and call it Todd. You know, and you're like, oh, okay. But the culture was doing that to me. They were like, so what is your platform? You know, and I was like, my platform? You know, and I was like, what could my platform be? And it became, and I was like, total disclosure. You know, and I just, what I'm pr promising you is total disclosure. And then later it was like, somebody was like, do you want a rally? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. What's a rally, you know? And then I realized, oh, I get all my artist friends to perform on my behalf in a, in a theater. And then at the rally, somebody said, do you have an economic advisor? And I would say, no. And she goes, well, I majored in economics at this little college in Massachusetts, and I've never used my degree. I would be your economic advisor. And I say, like, okay. <laughs> so we went to a cafe, and we hammered out my economic plan, which was amazing. So the whole thing was this long kind of workshop with what it would be. It was everybody in grade school should do this. I mean, like, I realized anybody could figure out how to run for president and what all your, you know, what your cabinet would be. You know, I mean, it's just even now, I, I thought, well, of course there should be a Department of Women, there should be a cabinet post that is about women. There should, we don't even have, in the States, we don't have a Department of Culture. We don't have one, you know? Well, what do you have in the United States now? And what, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> good question! And what is, I think we're gonna have to answer, but what is the poet's role in the United States today, I mean, I talked to an American this morning who said it's the end of democracy. Um, oh, democracy. First of all, it never was. What? Okay. It's been over for a long time, mm. too, I think. I mean, democracy meant that women couldn't vote, that black people, slaves couldn't vote. You know, it was like, what was, democracy meant that people who owned a lot of land and had a lot of money could vote, you know? But as a political poet as well, what is I, what? I mean, I mean, you have your work cut out for you now, I right. guess. So, w what is your work now? What are you doing? What 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 do you see as as your role? Well, in, I think this. Uh, in I think doing this. I mean, I have to say. I mean, what? I'm, I mean, I'm interested in other things. I mean, I think there should be if if abortion becomes illegal in much of America or. Already it's illegal in so many places. I mean, I think we should start developing an underground railroad so that women and people who have money could fund people who can't afford to go where there is an abortion. You know, like house them, pay for buses, get them to where we can do it. You know, I mean, I think we need to, you need to create your own government in a way. So I think, in ter I believe in real things, but you know, the night, of the, uh, the night of the election, I was in Kenosha, Wisconsin doing a reading and it all went really well, went out to dinner, felt good, went back to my motel to watch Hillary win, and then I was like, oh my God. And the next day I was on a campus and, and, and Wisconsin was a red state that had voted for Trump, you know, and so I was just, 
at a lunch with graduate students and then at a reading that night in a library. And, and I just felt like I was an occasion. You know what I mean? Like I felt like whoever came to my reading, that was the only thing they could think of to do the night after the election, you know? And so naturally we talked about it. We were just, I mean, every gathering in the past year for me has been a political gathering because everybody is like, you know, what do we do? Where do we, you know, where do we go? How do we, how do we respond to this? So I think, you know, certainly just doing what I do has changed again. It doesn't, it feels very much like it did when I was running for president, just because, you Would know. Would you do it again? Run for president? No, I think once no. you've done it, you're always doing it. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Eileen, thank you so much. <laughs>